Movements encouraging people to reduce mowing frequency and let weeds grow free are gaining traction. The No Mow May and the Low Mow movements say mowing less helps create habitat and increase wildlife diversity, including the sustainability of bees and other pollinators. But not everyone agrees with the approach. Neighbors of a Columbus, Maryland couple complained to the Homeowners Association saying the garden of Janet and Jeff Crouch was an eyesore. The couple said their space was designed to help the ecosystem. Neighbors said it violated association bylaws. The case went to court and the couple won while prompting a change in Maryland law that allows homeowners to make wildlife friendly decisions for their property. Meanwhile, in Maine, State Senator Maddie Daughtry introduced a bill that would prohibit certain landscaping restrictions. The bill has faced no opposition and faces further action in committee. And as you can see from this map, Maine, along with the other 19 states shaded in white, do not have laws on their books addressing pollinator health. But as lawmakers examine the topic, condo associations and neighbors are looking closely as lawn culture wars blossom. Meg Hilling spoke with experts to break down the facts, myths, and mysteries of not mowing our lawns. As the weather warms and your yard comes to life, so is the debate over what should be done with America's lawns. No Mow May is the three-word directive dividing neighbors across the country as grass begins to slowly creep up in height. Odds are you've seen it popping up on headlines, trending on social media, or setting off heated debates in your local gardening chat groups. So what exactly is it? No Mow May at its core is such a simple idea. You, know, you don't mow for a few weeks, you have flowers, and you have happy bees. And that's Matthew Shepard with the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation, a nonprofit dedicated to protecting pollinators and their habitats. Think bees, butterflies, moths, and flies. The No Mow May movement was launched in 2019 by the UK conservation group Plant Life. The idea being that if you don't mow your lawn the whole month of May, declining pollinator populations and the plants they feed on would have a chance to rebound in your area. The idea spread across the Atlantic, first being picked up in Appleton, Wisconsin in 2020, before spreading elsewhere in the states, with environmental groups like Circe's taking notice. Make it fit what you want. I mean, no mo may, it's not like there's rules. There's no, there's no no mo may police sneaking around, checking out your lawn and citing you, you know? If you would like your lawn to be longer, I mean, let it grow. Maybe it means instead of mowing it twice a week or once a week, you mow it once every other week, you know? But not everyone is buzzing about a break from yard work. Gardening is work. And if you want to have pollinators, visit your garden all season long, you know, which can be even in Buffalo from April through October. Not mowing your lawn is not the way to do it. It won't help you. That's Elizabeth Licata, an editorial writer for the Buffalo News and longtime gardener. She's been digging into the No Mow May movement, most recently in an op-ed, where she points out that consideration for pollinators needs to extend beyond just a month if we want our actions to have a long-term impact. You have to put a little more thought into it than that. You have to maintain a perennials and even flowering trees and shrubs that will provide steady diet for these pollinators that they can come back to month after month. And Lakata warns that if you do go to mow your lawn after taking a month off, don't be surprised if the grass doesn't respond well. When you do mow that lawn, presuming that you still want to have it, you're really damaging it. You're cutting off about three quarters of its growth and you're doing, you're shocking it. You're quite literally shocking your lawn and you're hurting it. There's also the chance that not mowing your lawn could set off testing exchanges with neighbors, unhappy with the site, or worse, violate homeowner association policies in your area, some of which have taken residents to court in the past over everything from the color, height, to even makeup of the lawn. The Washington Post cites 2005 data from NASA that estimates that there is roughly 40 million acres of ornamental lawn in the U.S., making up roughly 2% of the land area of the lower 48 states. And to maintain all that, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency estimates that Americans spend roughly 9 billion gallons of water each day on landscape irrigation. As a result, lawns have increasingly come under scrutiny by state and local officials for water use, especially in Western states. Some have begun encouraging residents to swap out their grass for more drought-resistant landscapes, such as clover, cactus, artificial turf, and even gravel. The ecological IQ of this country is really low. We don't get it that we, we are 
living off the life support that healthy ecosystems provide. If we don't support those ecosystems, we don't have that life support. Doug Talamy is an entomologist at the University of Delaware and author of Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard. We now need to practice conservation outside of parks and preserves. And what's outside in parks and preserves is private property. So the private homeowner is actually the future of conservation. And my job has been to tell them that. They don't know that. And the group best suited to tackle these conversations might not be who you would expect. The most powerful people in the country right now in terms of the environment are baby boomers. They're retired. They've got money. They're trying to figure out what to do with their lives. Um, they can be a really powerful source, but it wasn't part of our, our upbringing. Nobody was, was trained in this. So the, the biggest hindrance is that they simply don't know that they are the future of conservation and that um, plant choice is, is the way to go. Tulemi says ultimately he'd love to see the area of lawn in the U.S. cut in half, but that doesn't mean getting out your shovel and digging up your grass right away. The easiest thing to do is, is plant a tree, plant two or three trees, and you put a bed around that tree and immediately you have less lawn and that tree's going to grow and then you, you expand the bed. Like many environmental debates, this one is not going away anytime soon. But experts like Tulemi, Lakata, and Shepard say they're happy that these conversations are finally getting the attention they deserve. We're a lot farther along now than we were 20 years ago. Um, you're, you're interviewing me. That wouldn't happen 20 years ago. And you recognize that this is an issue. People recognize that the 135 million acres we have in residential neighborhoods counts. We're recognizing that, that our parks are not enough to preserve the biodiversity that we need. So we've got to do conservation outside of the parks. Where's it going to happen? It's going to happen in your yard. Meg Hilling, Scripps News, Chicago.